Mr. Chairman, comrades, following on from Graham's contribution, just a word about, for those who don't know me. <laughs> I first joined the Young Communist League after the age of 15. And at about the same time, I met this enigmatic, dynamic Scotsman called Frank Waters. Frank did not just encourage, he directed. And he directed you what you had to do. And war betide you if you didn't. It was the best education program I ever had in my life. There were, of course, some significant moments that did cause me to question what I was doing. He said on one occasion, Come on, you're going to speak at the media rally. Embarrassingly. Good. For five minutes. Well, that was a long time for me. <laughs> when I arrived, there was a chairman, Frank, a dog, and me. <laughs> so I said, Frank, there's nobody here. I know. I said, Comrade, how can we make a speech when there's nobody here? Comrade, let me tell you. If you can get up today and speak to nobody, you'll have no bloody problem speaking to anybody in future. He was dead right. I spoke for 15 minutes to nobody except the dog. But it was a, a training course. He was introducing me, yes, in the deep end, but it was to pay dividends that resulted in cooperation and friendship that lasted a lifetime and, interestingly enough, important in terms of Salt Lake. Forty-seven years ago, the trade union movement, the labor movement, <coughs> I separate the two, together with the university students and the general public in Birmingham came together in a way that was in many ways unique. They were not prepared to see what was taking place in the name of what was being described by the government as law and order. They were witnessing on their editorialized television programs Miners' pickets beaten, punched around, arrested, all in the name of keeping order and ensuring the so-called free movement of traffic. Nowadays they're all in favour of their free movement, aren't they? In the <laughs> European Union. But in any case, what happened was, at that time, we had 300,000 miners. And I'll tell you how it started. On the 9th of January, 1972, the Miners Union decided we'd had enough. After years of inept leadership, with some honourable exceptions in the areas, like the legendary Jock Kane and A. Buffett, both in the Communist Party, and Tommy Degnan, who fought in the Spanish Civil War, and who, by the way, not a lot of people seem to remember this, but I do, because I was very close to him, was sent by the Communist Party in the period just after the Russian 
revolution. And he worked with three individuals who no one remembers. Lenin, Stalin and Trotsky. Now you can't get a better trio than that, but he did. And so he was able to impart that information to me. It stood me in good stead. <coughs> when the strike started, it produced some very interesting comments. I'll have to put my glasses on to read this because if somebody from MI6 have crept in, the usual is. <laughs> or they'll have a book. Or both. I want them to understand what was said. It said this. When the strike started on 9th of January 1972, it was generally considered by the media that the miners could not win. It went even further that Ark I Ringer, I said Ringer as well as Winger, called Woodrow, Woodrow Wyatt, wrote in the Daily Mirror newspaper the following words, quotes, Rarely have strikers advanced to the barricades with less enthusiasm or hope of success. The miners have more stacked against them than the Light Brigade in their famous charge. Well, the miners and the working class of Birmingham proved him wrong. And the leadership in Birmingham and in the Miners Union in Birmingham demonstrated there were a better quality than those who sacrificed those in the Light Brigade. In other words, we showed that it could be done. On the 9th of February, I can recall being instructed, advised, <laughs> by Frank Waters that we had to do something. Would I do it? Would I address a mass meeting of the AEU in the bull ring? I wasn't conversant too well, well with the bull ring. I was after. And after that, would I meet with the TNG? Oh, and by the way, and after that, there are three other unions that you ought to see. This was after a full day leading on the picket line. He was a bit of a driver, but of course in the best possible way. And he always said one thing. Leaders who are quality and calibre and principle lead from the front and not the back. Well, I like to think that history has demonstrated that I led from the front every day on that picket line and everyone since. And I think that trade union leaders today ought to learn a lesson that you don't sit back and just talk to a few people in a room. You go out there and you part and parcel as long as it takes to lead workers and show by example what needs to be done. I want to pay my tribute on this occasion to a number of people in addition to Frank who played an outstanding role in what took place in Birmingham in 1972. Moira Simmons, who was a leader in the club of the Fellow Labour Party. She was absolutely outstanding and really an inspiration. And Frank Waters and her together combined. It was a united front that was demonstrating how people could come together in a cause. Of course, we also had Alan Law and as Graham said, 
it was no idle threat when he said, <laughs> listen brother, if you go through there, you've had it. True. Next day I was in the office at 7 o'clock at night with Alan Law. And this bloke who'd gone through the picket line was weeping at the door. And he says, what's he want? He said to his secretary. She says, he wants his job back. They've sacked him. I said, what for? Silly me. He went, through, he went through a picket line against the advice of Alan Law. Now that demonstrated leadership. Maybe crude. Maybe comparable with what happened in the United States of America with the Teamsters Union. But nevertheless, times, places, issues determine what you do and how you do it. Of course, other people demonstrated what they saw at Salt Lake. One described, you'll know him, Trist Tristan Hunt. He says it was almost medieval <laughs> in its choreography. Yeah, he said, at various stages, it was a siege. It was a battle. It was a rout. It was a rout of the police in the final analysis. We'd taken enough. And that night, when I addressed the meeting that had been organised in the bull ring it was packed. And I'll be honest with you, I was knackered. I'd been without sleep, I'd been on the picket line, but I knew I'd got to speak to this mass meeting. Arthur Harper was in the chair. And he said, Comrades, Brother Scargill is asking you to support him. And I made it clear, and it's now in song, and it's now in verse, and it's true. I said, we've had messages of support, and we're grateful. We've had donations, and we're grateful. But I'm not asking you to put your hands in your pockets and give us a pound, or a few coppers, or many pounds. I said, I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you to come out on strike and join us on the picket line where we're being battered. <coughs> I said, you've got a chance to do one of two things. Ignore my plea and live with that in the future. Or come out on strike and join us and write yourself into history. And to their eternal credit, they did. The latter, they decided to come out on strike. But during the course of that meeting, Arthur Harper motioned to me and said, We've only got one problem, comrade. And he pointed to this man at the back. He says, Every time we mention industrial action, he will raise a constitutional issue. So I could feel myself getting set to argue the constitution, the politics, the class issue, all the rest of things that leaders do. And this man stood up and he says, Brother Scargill, I've only got one question for you. Forgive the accent. I said, yes. What time do you want is there? <laughs> what I didn't know and they didn't know is four brothers were all working and on strike in the mining industry. Demonstrates that events and places and times can create different situations. What it was in Saltley was best described by a number of people who were politicians. Tony Benn said this was a victory 
not just for the working class, but for democracy. And of course, <coughs> we have people in the movement generally who recognise the significance of what took place. Graham's mentioned the effect it had here in Britain. But I can tell him, <coughs> because I have travelled all over the world, and they teach what happened at the Battle of Salt Lake, whether it be in Cuba, Australia, China, all of these places know about it. <coughs> they pay tribute to it. It's written in their essays. Because they recognise that it was a coming together in Britain's second largest city of workers who said, no, we've had enough. And we're prepared to fight back, not for us, but for the workers who are in direct struggle because we recognise that their fight is our fight. What we do today could happen to us tomorrow. And that's why they turned out in their thousands. Graham's described and people generally do describe their feelings on that day. My feelings, I don't think I could ever put them into real words. I never in my life had a feeling like it. On that day when they were defeated, the ruling class. When they locked the gates at Salt Lake, they didn't just lock a gate, they signed an agreement not to reopen it. They signed an agreement on our terms, which we wrote, that the only fuel to leave it would go to hospitals, to schools, to the disabled, to the infirm, and to those in care. That's a victory. That's a demonstration, I think, of leadership. And that's what we need to do. You know, at a meeting like this to celebrate and to commemorate the Battle of Salt Lake Gate would be an insult to those brave men and women who took part if we didn't talk about other issues. But I have to mention one in particular group of people who did participate in the Battle of Salt Lake Gate. And that was the workers who were women, who in their thousands turned out. I tell you, I have never seen anything like it in my life. You have to imagine every single day on that picket line being battered. They, ar they arrested me once. By the way, it wasn't a judge that freed me. It wasn't a jury. It had something to do with the fact that about 800 pickets were outside the police station <laughs> demanding my release. And they said, on this occasion, we're simply giving you a warning. <laughs> Not a caution, just a warning. We'll now take you back to the picket line. Because <laughs> it was out of control. And of course, on the final day, when the gates were going to be closed, They'd have got a tactic, or so had I. Their tactic was, and I heard Kappa, the Chief Constable, say, when they come in, make sure they move straight through. Well, that's the last thing they were going to do. I threw this megaphone I had, told them to stop, and they piled up like a sandwich. You couldn't move. You had to be there to fully understand what happened. And there were all sorts of shouts going off. Because there were various groupings, whether it was the extreme left or the people who normally wouldn't be involved in industrial action. Some shouting general strike, some shouting victory to the miners, some shouting different slogans. And I took up a slogan, 
closed the gates and it caught on and it began to echo and every time they said it don't forget you're talking about thousands they took a step forward forward towards the gates and if ever you've seen fear on the ranks of the establishment in the form of the police that day you saw it there were no threats there were no truncheons there were no riot gear they didn't know what the hell to do and he took the decision close that gate and that's how it came about and I said to the television cameras on that day it's the greatest day of my life ever since I joined the Young Communist League I've read, all the time I've been in the Labour and Trade Union movement I've always had the vision of workers in struggle coming together on that day it happened from five directions the sight of them coming in was a sight I could never forget and will never forget that's why I try every single year to be here to speak at the anniversary date of the Battle of Salt Lake Gates. I think the only time I missed was it last year, I can't remember. I was on an operating team, table, but apart from that, I was all right. But I turned to the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why? Because the European Union is directly connected with the struggle that took place in 1972. Yeah. In 1972, in Britain, 80% of our economy was based in manufacturing. It was in coal, steel, motor car manufacturing. We actually built cars ourselves. Fishery, farming, all the things that matter to sustain life we were manufacturing 80 percent do you know what it is today 10 percent who caused it european union their policy not ours i've got a farmer not far from my place in yorkshire he's got lots of land he happens to be a socialist and he says to me, I'm in a ridiculous situation. I am being paid not to grow food. Just imagine, at a time when these hypocrites are importing potatoes from Israel, as well as other continental countries throughout the world. Just imagine that on a shelf. I'll not tell you my words in the supermarket I visited when I saw them. I could have thrown the bloody things at them. We grow the best potatoes in the world. We've got acres of land. No reason why we shouldn't do it. There was a programme of sympathy this week on television from Holland. The interviewer, she said, it really is sad. These people who produce tomatoes, they're going to be out of business if Britain leaves the European Union. And they spoke to this young man. He said, it is rather difficult. We know what are we going to do? We have all these tomatoes. And they had thousands of acres under glass growing tomatoes all year round in a sophisticated operation and I asked the question why? why is it we can't do it? the climate's the same the reason is it's good to outsource for them capitalism always outsources in fact I wouldn't be surprised if every vestige finally goes. They've outsourced the government. 
<laughs> Royal family's next. Good riddance. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, think about it. Why is it that we're doing our utmost to try and save factories in industries which are being moved under the single market and the customs union? Why is it we don't say goodbye and start building in that factory British cars? We used to build the best in the world. The landmark, the marks on each of those cars, now owned by someone else, demonstrates how good they were. There's no reason on earth why we can't do it again. And if they leave, so good, let them go. There's nothing to stop us getting cars from somewhere else. But more important, we should be producing them ourselves. A self-contained economy. A self-sufficient economy. I remember reading as a young communist, Professor Deji Bernal, A World Without War, A World Without Want. He produced mathematically the case for being self-sufficient, being able to produce all that we need. Well, of course we don't produce pineapple or we don't produce some exotic fruit, but we produce everything else that's needed to sustain life. For God's sake, during the Second World War, from 1938 to 1945, we did just that. And we produced actually a healthy population. And if we could do it then, we can do it now. In other words, we should be campaigning for production of our own goods. The idea that's being put forward, and I am going to be critical. What the hell's gone wrong with the Labour leadership? I don't know how many people read about the speech that Corbyn made in Ireland some years ago. I know that about that because I was invited to speak at the same meeting by Jerry Adams. We were speaking against the Lisbon Treaty. We knew how deadly it would be because it produces the final <coughs> little notch in the Maastricht Treaty and all the treaties before, whether it be the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Paris, right the way back to the coal and steel community. In other words, they want a system where they take decisions in private, in secret, and then they tell the European Constitution what it's got to do. You've heard about tariffs. I'm sick of hearing the word. Do you know what a tariff is? It's an import control. But the difference is, when it comes in with an import control, it's not ours, it's theirs. They even suggested that we collect it for them. I mean, how daft can you get? During the years when apartheid was rife, and our comrades in South Africa, our black comrades in South Africa, were struggling, and we were helping them, We were implementing policies that demonstrated what was happening. Coal from South Africa, steel from South Africa, coming in. Cheap. It wasn't cheap at all. And I've got a good source for this, by the way. Do you know who told me the story? Nelson Mandela. Privately. What they were doing, they were subsidising their industries so they could sell internationally at below the cost of production. And at home, they were charging excessive amounts to the native population, black and white, 
in order to sustain that policy. But Labour and Tory governments from 1945 had a different approach to it. It was a sensible approach. We imposed import controls to stop this. We also import, implemented import controls against countries like Colombia, where they were producing coal with eight-year-old children. Well, I'm sorry, if that's bloody competition, I want none of it. And I don't think anybody in their right mind would disagree with that philosophy. policies today, you go into a shop, there's cheap clothing all over the place. But who's producing it? Not only in the main women, in countries like Bangladesh, Rana Plaza. but more important with children in appalling conditions. And they call that competition. I can remember when these shops were producing here in Britain, their own cotton, their own wool, their own materials of the highest quality. And then, on display in their own shops. And what was that doing? It was ensuring work for people here. It was ensuring that monies made were going into the health service, the education system, care for the elderly, and all those things that make life bearable. Today what we've got is local authorities having to say we're only going to have a bin collection once a week for a fortnight, once a month. Put it in a green bin, a blue bin, a pink bin. What a load of nonsense. There's no need for it. They're exporting most of it to be recycled by somebody else or sorted by somebody else, mainly in Indonesia or in India. Do you know the answer? We had it within the coal mining industry. And if there's any coal miners in here, they'll tell you. We built gigantic plants. They were called washeries. And all that came out of the mine went through this washery plant. We didn't sort it into bits and pieces, in blue bins and pink bins and red bins. As it went through the system, it was automatically sorted. So that you finished up with all the grades that you wanted, and the waste product was dealt with properly and used for landfill on the roads. Not in a landfill site, but for the base for a motorway or a roadway. Common sense, instead of digging a great big hole and despoiling the countryside. So there's always an answer. But to do that, you've got to have investment, common sense and foresight. Of course, as I say, the economic <laughs> argument I advance, and I always do, look at the statistics. 80% of our economy was based in manufacturing before we went into the European common market. 10% today. In our balance of payments with them, it's even worse. Every single year in our trade with the European countries, within the European Union, we're in deficit to the tune, on average, of 80 billion. So we lose 80 billion in our trade. By the way, that's a lot of money. In our trade with the rest of the world, whether it's in the Caribbean, or it's in Africa, or India, or China, we're 40 billion in surplus. Now if you've got two shops in Birmingham, and one says we'll sell you an item, the same item, at one pound eighty, and the other one says we'll sell it at one pound. Which shop would you go to? You'd be an idiot if you went to the one one eighty, wouldn't you? 
But that's exactly what we're doing. All to support this monolith, the European Union. But of course it's got more than that at stake. The European Union wants to see a European <coughs> army. <coughs> it wants to see the development and expansion of NATO. It wants to see the trade implementation policy spread even further so that it's got central control. Why is it that Germany have taken over the majority of car production? Who owns the mark of Rolls-Royce or Bentley? The Germans. Who owns the mark of others? The French. They produce about four different models. And of course, don't forget, the Germans have taken over the Skoda from Czechoslovakia. There's no reason on earth why we can't here in Birmingham, Britain's second biggest city, produce cars. I'm talking about our own cars. We've got the technology, we've got the intellect, we've got the ability, and we've certainly got the workforce. And it's a time when we're already converting from diesel and petrol onto yeah. electric. There's never been a better time to develop, yeah. invest and produce that type of vehicle. They were advertising last night a wonderful scheme in the south of England where they've imported, <laughs> imported trams and buses that are electric. They're driven by electric. We've imported them. Why couldn't we build them? Why couldn't we supply them? We not only don't supply them, we don't even produce the steel that supplies them and builds them. And that's the kind of policy that we're facing. I want to expose the nonsense that the Labour Party are now advancing about the customs union and the single market. Because when we voted to come out of the European Union, we also voted to come out of the single market and out of the customs union. <coughs> the customs union, broken down into simple language, is this. The European Union sets the import control or the tariff that's got to be put in by every country. So even if we could get a really good deal, say with India, or Africa, or Venezuela, we can't do it. We're precluded from doing it by the conventions and the directives laid down by the European Union. That's why Corbyn's wrong to even talk about a customs union. It's deadly, unnecessary. All he has to do is look at the history well, for 45 years, he fought against the customs union. And secondly, common sense should tell him that if goods come into this country, if we want to have, have a, an import control, we can impose it. And stop the trade, either from child labour or from cheap labour, from wherever it, it takes place. In the single market. How many people realise that the single market embodies as a right from their point of view that we must have free movement of labour yeah. and capital? Now, I'll explain the difference. The free movement of labour is a misnomer. The free movement of labour means they can move people from one country to another in their thousands if necessary. I'm not talking about immigration. I stand for immigration, asylum seekers and those in fear of their lives. I am against and always have been since I was 16. Migrant labour, just walking in. We've got a birth rate in Britain of 1.8. Now common sense tells me that if you've got 1.8 birth rate, your population's going down because you need at least two 
to maintain the, the birth rate you've got. Logic tells you that. So where have we got the extra seven million from? And in order to finance the extra seven million migrants who've come in, because that's where they've come from, in Europe, out of the budget that was established for a population of 59 million, we've now got to use that 59 million budget to supply a population of 67 million. That's 8 million more. Mm -hmm. Well, the two figures don't, don't match. Any economist pressed would have to tell you that. Even my basic understanding of economics tells me that. And of course, it also means the export, not of labour, it means the export also of business. Companies can say we're going to go out of Britain and manufacture somewhere else. And that means unemployment in this country. Well, you know the Nissan plant is saying they're going to produce the new car in their own country. Right? Take over the factory, produce our own type cars. Now. Make them electric. Now. No reason at all why we shouldn't do it. They know and we know that the reason, for example, that they've abandoned their investment in the nuclear power plant in Wales isn't because they suddenly had a, a vision that it's uneconomic or a vision that it doesn't work in terms of safety. It's because it, they know it's an absolute disaster and that they're the only country in the world apart from France, that is now developing nuclear power. Everybody else has, uh, have abandoned it. So there's a way in which we can stop them exporting their businesses. Do you know the way? It's called nationalisation or public ownership. Don't tell me it can't be done. In 1945 to 1948, the then Labour government took into nationalisation, road transport, rail transport, steel, coal, electricity, gas, water, and all the normal facilities. Oh boy, what a difference it made. It was cheaper, more efficient, and certainly more <coughs> profitable for the working class of this country. Try ringing up for help to one of these companies. You go through and it says, which number do you want? Tell us what it is, we'll pass you on. We'll see, send someone in about 15 days, it'll charge you 70 pounds. When it was nationalized, if something went wrong with your gas, you rang up. They said, we'll send somebody out, and they were there in a, half an hour. That's the difference between a nationalized industry and a private industry. In other words, it's a common sense policy to have that, so we not only stop the free movement of people, but we also stop the free movement of capital going out. And that hypocrite, Dyson, sweeping up, I'll tell you what I'd do, I wouldn't buy a bloody buy a Dyson product for the life of and no way would I do it. It really is hypocrisy, isn't it? Mm. For someone to say, I want to come out but I'm going to produce my cars in Indonesia. I think that uh, we have to question why it is that Jeremy, who I've been a friend with for 40 years, is changing his policy. Please don't tell me he can't come out and speak his mind. In the 1983 manifesto of the Labour Party, it was four, very clearly four, coming out of the European Union. The trade union movements were four, coming out of the European Union. Why on earth are A, the trade unions wanting to stay in the European Union, and B, 
why are trade union leaders going to meet Mrs. Thatcher, Mrs. Well, same one, <laughs> Mrs. May. Mrs. May. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Same one. Yeah. Reincarnation. Yeah. And asking, what could we, we do? Talking to them. What the hell is it to talk about? What they should have said, no, we're not meeting. Implement the policy of decision of the British people who voted to come out of the European Union. Absolutely. But more important, Labour should be doing the same. I find it deplorable yeah. that not only Jeremy is now talking about a customs union needed or a single market being needed, but you've got his deputy saying something completely different to him, saying we've got to be really attached to a second referendum. You've got Emily Thornberry talking about issues which should be, have been put to bed yet years ago. Nobody's got a better policy or a better history than the Labour movement against racism in all its forms or anti-Semitism. <coughs> We've always fought for those principles and indeed always will. And all those workers who are here irrespective of colour, creed, religion, whatever it is, we will defend in exactly the way we would defend anybody else. That is a policy, in my view, of a socialist and someone who should give real leadership. Where is leadership? Don't tell me leadership doesn't matter. It certainly does. I don't <coughs> believe, as has been mentioned already by both the chair Graham and everybody else, we closed down the operation at Orgreave in exactly the same way that we closed down the operation at Saltley for one day. And I urged that day, even though they'd taken me into a hospital, having been knocked out by the police, I urged that we intensify the picket, not reduce it. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't succeed. Totally in our aims. But don't forget that the greatest, the greatest victory in that strike was the struggle itself. It always will be. But I'm going to let you know a secret. Don't often say this, you know. I did a television programme some years ago. And when I can get hold of, well I've got it on VHS. When we can get it converted onto DVD, we'll put it out. But we can't put out what happened after. But I can tell you. The, the interviewers, get this, with Tracy McLeod, you may have heard of, I don't know, but she was a good interviewer. And the young interviewer called Michael Gove. <laughs> <laughs> she was interviewing me and saying that the programme I'd done in 1982 called Futures was a superb look forward. It was almost like Nostradamus. Okay? Michael Gove was interviewing a Tory minister. He was then a young Conservative. Afterwards, we sit down in the reception room where I wouldn't participate in any of their largesse. I just had a cup of tea waiting for a taxi. But of course, you're sitting at the same table. And the minister, who I wasn't going to name but I will, was called Alan Clark, MP. And he said, you know Arthur, as though he'd known me years, I'd never met him before. <laughs> he said, I can never understand it, you know. Why it was when you'd successfully won the, the strike in 1984, why it was that uh, all of a sudden uh, things changed? He says, don't you agree? I said, oh yes. <laughs> I, I had the clue what he was talking about. He says, I remember Margaret, that's Thatcher, <laughs> called us together and said, after the under-managers had taken their decision to go on strike via ballot, 
we now had no alternative but to give in to the miners uh, as di diplomatically as we can and resolve the dispute. Right? So we won. He says, you'll remember that. I said, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. He says, and then, after the under managers have voted, we were called back in to say, now that they've voted not to ta take strike action, she said, we've no need to settle. I said, do you mean the deputies union, the National Association of Deputies uh, Shot Firers, NACODs? He said, that, that, that's the one, yes. Yeah. It was the only time in my trade union life that I'd ever heard the TUC leaders actually ask a union to go on strike because they knew what had happened and yet that union to this day has never explained why with an 86 percent majority vote to take strike action they suddenly over two days changed their position and we'd won the We'd won this dispute. That's a history lesson for you. I'll stand up and say it anywhere. It's absolutely true. And Michael Gove was sitting there. I don't say for one moment that he was listening to every word of that. Or even Tracy McLeod. But they were at the same table. But Alan Clark was there as clear as a bell. And I tell you this. It's the nearest I've ever come. I don't know how many people have seen the film All the President's Men. Well, you've got the reporter writing on bits of paper in his pocket. I'm writing you bits of paper, what he's saying, <laughs> and putting them in my pocket. Mm. I thought, I've got, to get, I've got to get this done. And within two hours of leaving that studio, I had that typed up. Exactly the conversation. It's there. And it's going to be ready, if ever, if ever the book's ready. In fact, in spite of my legal actions, which constantly come at me, uh, it'll be there. Mm. But it's on the record already today, so you've got it. It's, a, it's a, a true story, and it demonstrates just how close the miners came to total victory at that stage. But in addition, of course, I am convinced that had we not voted to go back to work, and it was only by seven votes, we would have won within two months because they couldn't have lasted. I'll tell you something else, I'm going to nail another myth. There have been suggestions by well-known learned journalists and authors about the divisions between uh, Peter Heathfield and Arthur Scargill on the one hand and Michael Magaki, the Scottish miners leader on the other. Let me tell you that during that dispute and after Arthur Scargill, Peter Heathfield and Mick Bagaki stood together like a rock. Not only that, Michael Magaki speaking at a conference in Wales after the strike made it clear that we were absolutely right to take strike action and we will not be constitutionalised out of action. That in my view was a statement and a view of a committed socialist and a principled position. So I hope I've nailed that one on the head because it needs doing. 1972 showed us the way. Don't forget history. As the chairman said, that's a funny old way of coming round <laughs> and suddenly being recognised. I would remind you that it took years before, even in Ireland, people recognised how great James Connolly was. <clears throat> it was also years before they recognised how great Jim Larkin was, the leader of the Transport Union. How many people in this room, for example, know that Jim Larkin the Irish trade union leader whose statue adorns O'Connell Street in Dublin 
gave the funeral oration for Joe Hill, the legendary American trade unionist who was murdered by the state simply because he was a trade union leader. Jim Larkin gave the funeral oration. If you don't believe me, it's on, it's on the internet. You can see it. But it's taken a hell of a long time for people to understand the dignity, the principle, and the foresight of those leaders. And I'm sure as time goes by, the battle at Salt Lake Gates will become writ at large in the history of our movement. I was going to write on the bottom of your mural, Banksy. That would have got it anywhere. It might have been. You never know. I'm going to spread the rumour. You'll be inundated. Royal College will want it. The art gallery will want it. Because it's an important piece of history. Mm. 47 years on, I reckon that I'm just as committed today as I was 47 years ago. And I know that the victory that we had at Salt Lake will be in the end a final victory that will bring about a socialist society, if not in my lifetime, hopefully in yours. Thanks for that. Uh, I think you'll see that um, the reason we've been having, I've learned more, again, each of these meetings have been gems to me. And uh, on the 45th anniversary, a comrade, the, uh, the uh, CP, um, GB ML in London, he came up to us and he, he, com he commented afterwards, this was a historic event. And you know, what we've heard today, and we're keeping this on record and we're putting it out. It needs to go out there. Not that there's any shortage of records of these events and Arthur himself. I mean, if you see things like his on Question Time, back in the days of um, uh, Robin Day, I think, but he's telling, a, uh, telling a student which newspaper, Ellis Times mm -hmm. and so on, read the Morning Star, he says. <laughs> um, of course, you know, the, the reaction was was r ridiculous, but um, I mean, there's, there's not one thing I've seen. If there are interviews, well, there's not been one dud where Arthur hasn't really come out on top. As far as I've seen at the moment, there's a lot there at the moment, and obviously a lot more to come out. And also, I mean, he, he, Arthur mentions uh, his meeting with um, Mandela. Lots, there's a lot more, lot more to tell personally, a lot more to tell about the movement and so on, so we need to do that. As far as the murals concerned, um, you know, the thought is, what's the idea? So if anybody wants to comment on that, that's fine. Anyway, um, Arthur, will you take a few questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Right, Stuart? Yeah, um, Stuart Richardson, Treasurer of the Birmingham TUC and Secretary of Birmingham Stop the War Coalition. Just a uh, sort of cover quick comment. Um, <coughs> I think that we've had a very vivid presentation of um, that great day, and the well, very vivid description of the uh, women workers and the solidarity coming out. Um, I think we should say, though, that there's not been much mention of the heritage in the sense that why can't you do that today? The reason you can't do that today is because there are vigorous, vicious law, anti trade union laws that ban mass picketing. And I think we also want to, because there's been a lot of discussion with the Labour Party recognised it's not just that that was introduced under the Thatcher regime, but they were actually strengthened, you know, the trade union laws under the Blair uh, um, um, government. And it, it was a quite an interesting sort of um, example of that, actually, um, in Parma this week, in which David Lamy made a great condemnation of the deportation of people to the, to the West Indies. And it was vividly sort of told, well, it was 2007, Labour government, which introduced this law, which means that these people are being uh, um, victimised, 
Belize and, and sent back to uh, uh, Jamaica. Just one very quick one on um, Venezuela. I mean, you have this thing about all oh, Russians are intervening in American politics, the American presidential politics. Now, I don't know whether they did or not, but that's terrible. But it's okay for America to intervene in Venezuelan presidential politics and say who should be the who should be the um, leader. And I also think it's not surprising. People say they were surprised by the social democratic leader in, in Spain. Um, the leader, the alternative leader, is part of the Socialist International, and you know they are going to be used as a pinnacle of the counter revolution. And you have all this talk about, well, let's have free elections. Well, does John Speller look look like Rampy? Does he say there should be free elections in Saudi Arabia? No, he gets uh, expenses all paid, visits to the place. So. This terrible hypocrisy, which we need to denounce on that. Um, one thing I slightly disagree with Arthur on it, I mean, I think that um, obviously the collapse of manufacturing as a percentage of the economy is a worldwide phenomenon, it's a capitalist phenomenon of modern capitalism. And I don't know whether it's been accelerated by the being in the EU, um, but I mean, it's a general phenomenon. Um, um, and just, just lastly on the EU, people should watch this very establishment programme um, that's on BBC Two uh, on Monday nights. And I'll just finish with this. Um, what was the vivid thing there? We have a debate in Britain about should you increase the um, health budget by 3% a year or 5% a year? What did the EU do to the Greek medical system after the people had voted against the deal? They forced them to close about a third of their hospitals, you know. So the EU, you know, deliberately, by their pressure on the, on the Greek government, destroyed <coughs> fundamental uh, uh, um, facilities for the people working class of Greece, you know. Right. Thanks, Stuart. Any more comments? Tons of questions. Four yeah. questions. <laughs> Do you want to There's four questions there. Any more questions? Just, just on that last one. Um, you've got a lot of jobs being moved to the east of Europe. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me that the, the EU says to any nations it wants to absorb from the east, don't worry, but you might have, you know, your economy might be perhaps down in the dumps and everything, but you'll be getting jobs and investment and everything from contributor nations like ourselves. Question on the trade union rights, which were supposedly given by the EU to the British workers, <laughs> and a lot of the trade unionists in this country are saying openly that they're going to be losing those rights, as you know, which are enshrined and are gifted to us. If we leave, you know, these. You've got six questions. <laughs> well, I've got six questions. We're in Britain down here. <laughs> And I forgive you for putting forward, but there you are. It's a, a good public meeting, and I'm, I'm happy to deal with them. Your first question is a very interesting one. You said that one of the reasons why, if I've got this right, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, why trade union leaders and indeed trade unions are reluctant to take industrial action and give the leadership that they should be giving is because of the anti-trade union laws. The mass pickets banning the mass pickets. Yeah. I disagree with you completely. The miners face the same anti trade union laws. Yeah. We were stopped on the motorway by squads of police, many of them from the armed forces dressed as police. We were told we couldn't pick it in en masse, we did. We had 13,000 arrested, we had over 11,000 very badly injured several hundred very badly injured, we had 11 dead, but we fought, we, def we defied an unjust law, just like the suffragettes did, just like the trade union movement did, the tall puddle martyrs did. Why is it that it, we recognise and we celebrate the Shrewsbury's uh, campaign where Ricky Tomlinson went to prison with Des Warren, because they were wrongly accused, but still accused of breaking the law on picketing. Why is it that we all got fined or prosecuted 
By the way, I, I also got prosecuted for uh, obstruction on a picket line in Orgreave. And we did the same thing, of course, I've told you earlier on today, in Solly. But we took the we took the decision that we either accepted laws that are unjust and unfair, or we fought against them. Mm -hmm. Why are they scared of them? We used to have laws that prohibited even combinations. But people like the levelers, <coughs> people like the diggers, fought against them. Women's struggle was a, an example. They did all sorts. You don't need me to spell out what they did. It's been on television, it's been on film, it's been celebrated all over the world. And they won the right to vote. And we won the right in 1906 for trade union rights taken away from us. Well, if they can take it away from us, we can take it back. And we can take it back by struggle. And we won't do that unless we're prepared, as has been said, in your contribution. And that was that unless we give leadership to people who, now, who know that we're going to fight for them, not just as a, an insurance policy in the event of an accident, but fight for their rights, we should, we should be opposing privatisation. We should be opposing outsourcing. We should be opposing all those things that we know to be wrong. In other words, we should be at the vanguard. And I'll give you one reason. In France, we've That's got great. the people on the streets all over France, week after week. But it's not the trade union movement. And if we don't do it, the student movement or someone else will take our place. Well, I hope that I'll, I'll join with them. My philosophy is simple. If there are workers in dispute and on a picket line, I join them. I was with the junior doctors on a picket line. I think I told you the story. This young girl, the junior doctor, came out and she said, she looked at this little old man here, and she said, uh, do you know, uh, would you like a, a cup of coffee? I said, no, thank you, it's all right. She said, do you know, she said, it's the first time I've been on strike. I said, is it? <laughs> She says, yes. She says, and I, it's the first time I've ever been on a picket line. I says, me too. <laughs> she, she didn't know who it was. But, you know, it, it was interesting that all of a sudden this young doctor who'd never been involved was involved. And I'll tell you what, involvement in the dispute, as Graham will tell you, as a professional historian, that involvement in struggle <coughs> will teach you more than a university three-year course or even a lifetime course in economics or political history. Involvement in the struggle itself teaches us what's at stake. The very act of being involved teaches you. We had young men in the miners' strike who came out and said, I don't know what we're going to do here. I don't know how long we'll be out for. And within three days, they didn't want to go back. They were at it. They were, they were fighting back against the, what they began to know was injustice. They were going to different forms of the community. They were involved with the Indian workers, the Muslim workers. They were going to different sections. The black community in London were, were, were tremendous with us. Yeah. And here in Birmingham, of course, at Salda they were. LGBT. LGBT, of course, yeah. you haven't seen the film. Yeah. Everybody was coming in with us. And we were welcoming them. And they were welcoming us. Because they recognised their struggle was our struggle and vice versa. Absolutely. So that's the first Absolutely. question. On repatriation, I agree with you completely. It's a nonsense. We should not be repatriating people from this country. They're here. And any of the workers who are here now, we should struggle, defend, and represent. Even with the criminal conviction, they should stay here. As far as I'm concerned, they're here. And that's our, our, our position. And I deplore the Home Secretary or anybody else who says we're prepared to deport someone to America who possibly faces either the death penalty on the one hand 
or 200 years in jail, because that's what they do in America, 150 years in jail. What a nonsense. It's high time that we began to defend those values that matter. So mm. I, I'm totally against the repatriation. The next one was about Venezuela, and this might be a controversial one. And I don't apologize for it. Because I think, apart from Cuba, uh, a lot of the socialist countries deserve a little bit of criticism. And I say that, and this is not name dropping, it's nothing like that. But I met the Soviet Communist Party leadership in 1957. And that was at the time of Khrushchev, Bulganin, uh, Molotov, uh, all the leaders that you've heard about. And I said to them, which I said to the East German Communist Party as well, and I said it to the Hungarian Communist leadership, the Czechoslovakian leadership, and others. You have to change your policy. First of all, you've got to allow people who want to leave your country to go. You've got to allow people to go on a holiday somewhere else if they want. And I said, if I can be a young communist at the time, with all that they throw at me, then you should have no difficulty letting Communist Party members from the age of one going abroad and defending a system that provides you with free education, a free health service, a free social service, and in retirement, a free pension and care in your early years. And unfortunately, in these countries, they've not taken on board the diversification that was necessary to sustain their systems. Venezuela is a perfect example. It's the richest oil producing nation on earth. Yet why is it that they haven't spent money diversifying so that it could be sustained without oil? Now, don't say it can't be done. The Norwegians have done it. The Norwegians have masses of oil, but they don't use it. They generate their power in the main from hydroelectricity because it's mountainous. And they use their oil for the benefit of their economy. So you could put a blockade on Norway and it wouldn't affect them. There's no reason on earth why in Venezuela they couldn't have developed massive industries, different operations, but they haven't done it, and they didn't do it under Chavez. In my view, that was a mistake. And it, does, it doesn't do any harm to criticise constructively comrades and people you support. And I deplore and condemn interference by the United States who are clearly wanting a change of leadership, a change of regime, just as they did want it in Iraq, in Libya, and of course, now in Iran. There's no argument about where they stand. It's a pity they don't take the, the same view about uh, other countries of what they're doing, bombing every day in uh, uh, Syria. And I'm talking about Israel. Why is it there's no condemnation there with all the resolutions of the United Nations? Uh, it's just a point of view that I have, and I, I can't understand the, te the technique that they have on the one hand to be able to go into space with the finest space craft. They're still using it. The Americans used the Russian spaceship to go up. Why can't they produce in these countries, when they were under communist control, different things that mattered? The thing that struck me in 1957 was that young women wanted the kind of dress, I don't mean dresses, I'm talking about dress, that the they could see in Western girls. They wanted the same kind of nylons or whatever it may be, or high heel shoes or whatever, but they couldn't get them. I said, why don't you produce them? I don't mean buy them from somewhere else. Why not produce them there? Because if you don't do that, you create a kind of longing on the one hand, an envy on the other, and a question mark in their minds of why can't we do it? Why is it they can do it? not realising the starvation that exists in the United States of America in the ghettos and because they're not shown that on television. But it's a point that we've got to take up 
within the labour and trade union movement and certainly the socialist movement and say what we feel should be done. Just imagine what it would be like now in Venezuela if they had the ability to grow crops all over Venezuela. All the food that they wanted could be grown. Just imagine what it would be like if they got factories that could produce different things needed internationally as well as nationally. But they would be censored, uh, they would be self-sufficient. Now if countries in other parts of the world can be self-sufficient, like Norway, why can't they? With all that oil, they ought to be swimming, not literally in oil, but in wealth. And to me, I think it's a, it's a mistake that's been made all the way throughout. Uh, and it's something that needs to be taken into account by anybody who is a Marxist. And I think uh, uh, as a Marxist, I have a right to say that. And if it produ produces a, a discussion or a debate, I'll welcome it. The next question that was, that was raised was the question, I had to put my glasses on, I'd love to read it, was the... Um, Stand, uh, the opposition that stand in, in Venezuela. Well, the man who was saying uh, he's the oppo opposition, and the man who they're recognising as the, as a president, did not even get nominated for, nor did he stand in the election. He's got no legitimacy in any way, way shape, or form. Incidentally, I'll give you some figures. The Americans say that 20 countries plus support their position on Venezuela. While the United Nations have 193 members, and 173 of them have not supported the American stand. I read that's a majority. <laughs> uh, <the coughs> final one is about the cause of uh, our economic ills, austerity in other words. Yeah. You know, the proportion of the economy. Yeah, I understand. Are in, oh, I understand. Yeah. The, you see that someone far more equipped than I'll ever be, called Karl Marx, explained it all those years ago. <laughs> um, mm. What happens is, in a capitalist system of society, Surplus. you reach a point where they can no longer have a situation where workers can buy back the goods they produce. Now, in my younger days, as uh, I don't think Graham will remember this, he was a bit too young at the time, even though I knew him as a very small child. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to godfather to his kid, but uh, that's, you see, family ties. But the, but the, but the thing is that uh, you, you, you learn ab about this at an early age, or I certainly did in my, in my politics. If you continue to produce and the objective of it is maximum profit, then if technology comes in, technology is used to sack workers, mm. not to help workers. Mm. It's introduced not to uh, increase necessarily the amount they produce, although it is on many occasions. One of the things is, you, it's, a, it's classic already, they're producing cars all over the world so it's not confined to the European Union. <coughs> Japan's in a hell of a state, and by the way, so is South Korea. So is America. They've got cars galore stocked all over the place, even second-hand ones. They can't sell them. The reason they can't sell them has got nothing to do with Europe. It's because they can't afford them. <coughs> They're not paying enough for them to buy back the goods they've produced. In my younger days, when I was a bit more athletic, I used to do the money trick on stage from the Ragged Trouser Philanthropists. And I used to go from one side of the platform to the other. And I used to show them how I could operate that these blocks of wood were represented industry, with these piles of monopoly money there, which represented finance. And when I finished doing the trick, I finished up with all the blocks and all the money. And you used to get shouts from the audience, that's not fair. I said, really? <laughs> I said, they wanted it, I've sold them it. And if they want some more, I'll sell them it. Uh, the price has gone up. 
<laughs> but you know, and it was a, it was a, an important example, theatrically yes, but an example of why it can't work. I remember being taught by people like Bernal, who said we would reach and James Klugman, uh, who was a brilliant philosopher, who said we may reach the position where we can produce in one month or even one year all the food and all the goods we want inside a week. So what do we do with the remaining 51 weeks? And there was a look of bewilderment amongst these young people in this class. Well, they said, why can't we ha ha have enjoyment? Why can't we have, for example, tuition? Why can't we learn about art, culture, mm. poetry? In other words, let's extend our ability to understand the world in which we live. Let's, let's look beyond even this planet to the universe. Let's examine what it is. In other words, utilize people. Even though we may work shorter hours, shorter working weeks, even virtually no working weeks. The important thing is, we'll be producing enough for them to feed, for them to clothe, and for the houses. There's no reason on earth why we can't put building workers to work to build houses. None at all. We could do that today. There's no reason on earth why we couldn't sell off cars at a knockdown price. Once they'd bought them, they'd need more cars. But it would affect their profits. Yeah. And that's their problem. And even capitalist companies are now beginning to say, we've got to adapt slightly in order to ensure that we pay more wages so that they'll feel, feel better off and they'll be feeling better off in terms of what they can buy from us. Don't forget there's a competition going on. They're in real trouble with the supermarkets. They don't know what to cut next. They're cutting jobs in the hope that that will solve the problem, and it won't. It will only intensify it, because the jobs that they axe will further create a problem with austerity that will mean a further lump of workers are in, unable to purchase the goods that they produced. Whether it's they that produce them, or their parents, or their uncles, or aunties, or whoever. So that's the problem with austerity. It's a product of capitalism, mm -hmm. and it's a class issue. And unless we grip it, understand it, and do something about it, and that means fighting back, we'll only build a trade union movement, as he and Tra said to, to say, we've got to do, we'll only build it when we take it into our hands to defy all of these things, and not leave it to the people like in France, from the student movement, who are leading, as they did in 68, the revolt against injustice and inequality. I believe that that, in Marxist terms, is the right, right answer. Mm -hmm.